All right, so in this video, guys, we're going to be creating something like one of these little uh, corner units. But basically, we're going to be doing some of the materials using an add-on called Grab Dock. And uh, so we'll try to flush as many of these out as fast as possible. And you can see how these kind of things lay out here. It's really not that crazy. It's pretty simple in nature. But uh, it's almost overpowered doing it in Blender with that Grab Dock add-on because you can actually do textures and materials and all kinds of fun stuff. This one was done in Substance, but this is um, in Blender. And uh, these are in Blender, too. So the, the thing is, is that you just got to think about what you need out of your environment. Like you can see the ceiling section is made up of these... Uh, different little tiles. So think like Minecraft or whatever, voxel system, right? Nothing really that crazy. And that's kind of the idea of a modular system in general. So we're gonna get started in a new scene here and we're gonna set up grab dock first. Set up scene, just like that, that's it. Um, and all we need to remember is that this is up. So if you hit Alt while orbiting, this is the top of the texture and, and we're gonna lay it out across this. Okay, and uh, we're gonna actually uh, uncheck visible. So it just hides it. We don't even have to look at it anymore. If you create a default plane at the center, that's correct. Okay. The only thing here is that the backdrop will Z fight with this thing. So you actually want to lift this up just a tiny bit. That's all, that's all you got to do to really get started. All right. We're going to put this on the desktop. You can see I already had a folder started, but we'll go ahead and uh, create a new one. We'll call this uh, kit two. All right. And inside of here, we want a couple folders. First up, we want a, um, maybe like something like a textures folder. All right. And we want a models folder. And if you're going to export your game engine, like an FBX folder is quite useful. It's really all you need for the most part. Um, but in textures here, all right, this is where I'm going to actually save my trims and my, uh, my, my file, my Blender file anyways. And we're going to also export to that folder, which I should have just clicked. Uh, except, okay, so we're going to export to that folder. You're going to have to rename every time you export, unfortunately, but that's what you're going to do. That's where you're going to place the name. All of this is good by default. Uh, we're going to be doing we're going to be doing the normals, the albedo, or base color, and roughness, metal, uh, metallic, metalness. Okay. Uh, we could do occlusion as well if we wanted to, but not going to be doing that in this one. Uh, all right, so we got our plane. We're ready to go. We can start. So we can make a modular trim sheet. We do absolute grid snapping. Go to the top view here. You'll see this lines up with the 10 centimeter grid. So we can place out a loop cut. And we can hold control and snap it around like this, right? And sometimes it won't snap right where you want it. So you might have to just move it again. When you're laying these out, just you'll get in the habit of doing it, basically. Uh, the loop cuts kind of go where they want. You have to place it back on the grid. So we're going to keep this one real simple here. Let's actually make it even more simple. So like we're doing a real basic wall texture or something. Um, you Generally your trims for your main architectural elements for your environments, uh, seamless textures even, that's what you're going to be creating. They're going to be really simple. Now, when you start doing details, you're going to want to have more kind of stuff going on maybe on a detailed trim sheet, right? So I'm going to press Y, separate these. If you have Mesh Machine installed, this will be a conflict. Uh, change Mesh Machine to Shift W. It works out pretty well. Set W to inset. You'll get used to it. You probably won't want to use it any other way. So um, anyways, we can grab all this, press E, extrude it up. And now these are all separate objects, okay? So if I press A, P, separate by loose parts, we can blow them apart. That's simple. So we can actually start to do bevels and things on these if we wanted to. So if I wanted to just do a chamfer here, I could do that. Let's say we're doing some kind of like wood grain or something like that. We could do a bevel, use a custom curve. Okay, and we don't have enough segments. We can bump up the segment count. And we can uh, fine tune this and adjust it and tweak it however we want to uh, get the kind of results we want out of it. Right? Whenever you do another bevel, it's going to use that same setup. So you might got to change, you have to change back to uh, super ellipse. Right. And you might want to bump those counts down. Maybe something like that, right? We're going to shade auto smooth these. You can also apply a way to normal using hard ops. Just hold Alt, click sharpen on the Q menu there. And um, your way to normal will be set up like so with keep sharp checked. 
if you're just going to use a modifier, check keep sharp. This actually works good here. You can do floating geometry. You could do a uh, setup like this, what we have going on here, which is also quite useful because you can turn on like box cutter and just go to town with booleans. You can use kit ops on it or the fun stuff. The only thing that you really want to make sure that is going to happen or occur is that right here on this side. And on this side, they match left to right. That's what makes it seamless. And also, if you're going to be doing an ambient occlusion, Take note that right here, this will become a hot spot. It'll turn bright. And so what ends up happening here is that the light bleeds in from the side. So before you bake, you'd want to take the whole thing and lay it out something like this. And if you are working on something that tiles up and down as well, you might want to lay things out on top as well. So just keep that in mind. We're not going to be doing that in this one, though. We're not doing AO, so it doesn't matter. But go ahead and... Uh, some changes real quick. Do a section like that, maybe scale it in like that. Grab these little sections real quick. This can be a little bit a little bit challenging to do sometimes, but it's not really that hard. Okay. Simpler the better usually. I've been get carried away and things get a little bit too too much noise. Make doesn't make it look that good many high frequency details right so something like this wall and you know just maybe splitting it down the middle even might be something you want to do you could split it towards the edges technically as well uh, but something like this you know just inset it a little scale it in on y maybe grab that loop that loop Alt shift click so using quads can be extremely useful shade auto smooth weight the normal there you go you're gonna get proper shading if you do this I want to turn on box cutter, just do some box cuts this as well. We're going to have to line these things up correctly, though. See if we start doing a lot of high frequency detail, kind of stuff like that. It can get a little bit wild. Uh, what you could do, you could try just overextending it a little bit, shift clicking. Whoop, whoop, messed it up. No, we're going to cancel that one real quick. And. Overextend it a little bit, shift clicking out here. <laughs> All right, it laser cuts it. I'm going to bring these cutters up though. Something like that, maybe. Um, something I do want to point out here though. Take a look at this cut real quick. We're going to use this add on. We're going to do the normals preview, but we want to click leave cam on exit of preview. Let's do the normals preview. Click OK. We'll get this. Turn off my wireframes. Look how flat this is. Like it's really sharp. Uh, you could use that potentially. I don't think it looks that good personally. So I'm going to press escape, get out of that. And now instead what you might want to do is um, not only maybe like taper these in a little bit, kind of retweak this here, do something like that. Uh, but more than likely you're going to want to bevel this all in this area because this will still be sharp. The inside might become beveled. Um, it, just, it just depends on what you want. Uh, so if I do a bevel here across the whole thing, you see, we might be able to work this out, but this isn't really set up all that well for this right now. So you could run into some potential issues, basically. And also, it's going to try to bevel all the way out here. It's going to create like a little seam. We did that using the bevel modifier, right? So we'd have to do maybe like weighted normals or something like that. You see that worked out much nicer. But maybe we don't want this affected, right? Um, you can't actually just delete it. And that'll keep the bevel from occurring. But however, you're not going to be able to do Boolean cuts on it at that point. And you can see they actually start to break down. And so you do need a manifold mesh, meaning it's solid. Uh, unless you use, I think, yeah, exact sometimes will work. But not always. So just be careful with things, all right? You can add whatever else kind of details you want to this. I'm just going to do another cut across here. Extrude it down. Bring it back, Q and E, hard ops. Trying to get that, that edge to see this could be a little bit tricky, right? Do I want to do this number? I don't know, I feel like doing a big section like this. That bottom face just going in like that would be fun. Putting it right in the middle of this thing. This one, we're going to put those edges on. 
we're not going to delete these this time. So when we bevel this, should get a nice little seam there. So if, like, if you were to take this and run it out, control, snap, we'll see this is what it's going to end up looking like. That's going to be where the seam actually is placed. All right. We can steel mesh as well. Um, using machine tools, I can just separate it real quick. Set it to individual. Do things like this. Control B, V, that number. Extrude it up. And I'll grab the back faces here. Scale them in. You can uh, bevel these as well. So we might want to bevel them. Mouse wheel up a few times. Push them down. A uh, difference. That number. What you'll notice here is that this um, suede normal is not really able to to control this thing anymore. If we shade these auto smooth, you can see it just doesn't it doesn't care really. I'll squish these by the way. Press S and Z, squish them a little bit. But sometimes you can only get away with so much. And then it just kind of breaks down. Let's see. I switch this back to exact now. Exact will get very laggy after a little while, so you gotta be careful. But we could reset the way to normal. Work out. This one, double it. So. This one doesn't bevel much right there, does it? <laughs> On that balloon cut. All right, that's kind of interesting. Got a little weird shading going on. Wait the normal. Yeah. What else can we do? I'm gonna inset these a little. Set them again. I want to take these loops here for these rings. So I'm doing a select loops uh, rings. Now I can bevel them. I just want to push this in. I feel like it's a good idea. Like an inset, hold control, push it down. We're going to do an edge rail. It should correct a little bit of it. Kind of created a weird shape, but X limited dissolve. We're going to do a 0 0.05 limited dissolve. And, um, get some kind of result like that going at least. So pretty horrible looking. Dating wise. So sometimes you do have to apply everything. Don't apply that way to normal. Just apply it, shade auto smooth, apply a new weighted normal. Sometimes that helps. Uh, in this case, it didn't do much of anything, but uh, sometimes you just have to go destructive, you know? It's just one of those things. Not sure why I can't. It's too. Uh... It's a back face on it? In front of it? It's weird. I'm going to delete that anyways. I don't like it. So. Oh, okay. Look at that. Still has a boolean taking effect. We'll get rid of that. We'll alt H real quick. Delete that. Ah, hide the cutters again. Change that one up a little bit. Yeah, so do take your time with the designs and things. You know, you want to make something convincing and believe. So you figure out what's going on, what you like, you don't like. This is a little repetitious and it's kind of boring in my opinion, so. What happens if we only did like um, half of it, maybe, right? What happens then? I get something like that. Okay. Let's try doing a uh, scale out like that. All right. So we don't need this many on the array, obviously. Also, I'm going to apply it. I'm going to place the origin point to the center of it and place it in the middle. So shift S with machine tools, you can do right to the geometry. We're still using grid snapping, so it places it right in the center. Uh, will this be perfectly symmetrical? This one's going to be a little bit large, I think, on the end. So sometimes you just got to tweak things a little bit. That's not unheard of, so you can do that. 
we can go ahead and collapse that down perhaps have a number like that sharpen we did normal something like that going now that's backwards though let's put it in the center again but change that balloon to yeah exact's gonna do that it's like it's inverted It's like a, yeah, you see, like, there's a face in there still. The other ones in the middle are actually working, I think, just fine. Yeah. This one is not. Um, so let's do this. Let's just fill it for a second. Probably should have did that. But let's change that bell over. I want to apply the boolean. Get rid of the object. I'm just gonna leave the bevel like super tight, I think. I should have probably extended it out, but yeah, let's do that real quick. Don't get too carried away, right? There we go. Yeah, we don't even have to collapse it on. Apply the balloon. Apply the bevel. Get rid of that. Sharpen it. Wait, it, the normals there. Uh, yeah. So there's a lot of things we can manually fix. Obviously, it's not it's not perfect up there, right? It's gonna look bad in the normal map. Right here. Tricky little area. I have a feeling if I just did some joins through these areas, pressing J, it cleans that up probably, but yeah, it isolates it to this area anyways. This is just bad geo. Bad geometry, bad, like if you quad, you like I'm starting to quad it up basically. You see the shading starting to want to fix itself, but it still wants other things like this quad really needs like a boundary around it to do this number. That would help out quite a bit. See what I'm saying? So yeah, bad geo can cause a lot of issues. And um, so you do have to be aware of it. Fortunately, because it is a boundary, should be able to fix these relatively fast, hopefully. Just by selecting all that. Probably don't need to do anything special here as far as cutting and connecting probably just do um, an inset should work out for most part maybe maybe an additional cut or two yeah because that's technically doing the right thing there but for whatever reason that just for that one additional edge even makes it work out a little bit soon. It's triangulating. Uh, all mesh triangulates at the end of the day. So what's happening here is it's triangulating from here to here and like here to there or something. Uh, for whatever reason, when you add this join here, it's... Well, what is it doing? Maybe it was triangulating this way somehow? I don't know. Something weird was going on there with the triangulation. Let's find out real quick. Uh, control T. Right. Yeah, so you see it was doing like I was saying. Kind of like I was saying, but for a reason it didn't like that. So when you do this number, retriangulate it. See, it's like basically the same thing. Why the edges help? Uh, honestly, I'm not entirely sure. It shouldn't have had an issue to begin with. I'm gonna bevel these all real quick. Just adds additional edges there to make it look a little bit nicer. I don't wanna get hung up here in this video trying to work a trim sheet to completion because I've wasted your time. So um, we're gonna move on from this one. Uh, we wanna save this thing though. And I put this into that kit folder 
under models, oops, excuse me, uh, the texture itself, I will put it right here. So I'll call this um, trims. And I, believe it or not, a lot of times, you can separate the files, but um, a lot of times what I'll end up doing, turn box cutter off first of all, is I'll actually take these, use an active element to move here. It's global, okay. I just want to make sure I'm using something with the origin point at the center here. Because if I move all of this, I need it to, to go along with the ride. And so I'll actually get rid of the cutters a lot of times as well. Although you don't technically have to. Um, you can just move these out like this, right? And so what ends up happening is that, well, now you have a trim. But let's say you needed something else as well. Like maybe you needed a floor tile. Um, you can start to create these things. I'll put it in zone group too. It's just, it gets out of control otherwise, so we can say this is trim 01. Yeah, and I don't have to think about it no more. I can just go over here, select objects, bam. Um, I think you can also do a shift L instance collection. No, shift L does do instance collection, but that's how you select multiple instances of the same thing. Shift G all by collection. Yeah, there you go. Done. Cool, right? Now, so we could do like other things too. So we can do like a floor tile real quick. We're gonna do a really cheesy floor tile just so we don't spend all day on it. But basically, I'm gonna inset just a little tiny bit. I'm gonna separate the mesh, extrude it up, scale it in um, individual, scale it in a little bit. And I'm gonna bevel this. See, it's beveling like so. All right, we can weight the normal. We can sharpen it. Shade auto smooth. Wait to know. Get out of smooth. I don't know. All right, so um, there we go. We got a floor tile, right? It's really thick, but it's it's something. Let's do this. We could actually go into edit mode and scale individual well to tighten it up if we need. Maybe we want to floor tile like that instead. So now we have a uh, floor tile. Right. Bam. And all the time, all this time, grab docs right there. So this is the way it works out. We can go through, we can pick what we want to export and set it all up appropriately. But our objects themselves, we can add materials to them. So this floor tile one, right? Maybe I want like a gray floor tile or on material preview. And I want like a, maybe like a dark gray floor tile, right? Like that. But underneath it, maybe I want that bottom section to have like a light gray grout, right? Probably won't even be able to see it, but let's, let's make it just enough so we can see it. So I'm gonna do that individual scaling again. So now, when you look at your texture, this is what you're going to get, right? See that little bit of uh, grout in there, hopefully. So you can add textures on top of this. I'll show you that on this one, I think. But same process. We're going to do a new one. Uh, I'm going to make these metal real quick. So metallic. Change the roughness. You could do like a... For this one, we could do like a plastic... So, yeah, it's just like a medium roughness, but it's like dark plastic. Maybe this is metal as well, but it's like steel. So we do like a darker gray, maybe a bluish gray. It's, we're just going to leave it rough, roughish like that. Okay. And um, you can UV map these things, but just project them from the view usually, uh, or use um, like object space mapping. So I'll, I, I'll do a video on there, I guess. Um, I don't think I've done one, technically. Sort of, kind of. I've done one. Alright, so we can do the numbers like that as well. But this one, maybe I'll just leave gray. Won't make it metallic. We'll just turn the roughness up a bit. Okay. And so, any of this stuff, let's say you want a material on it. Well, these are object-based maps. Um, so let's say I got this aluminum. Let's do aluminum on this one. 
Okay, it's going to load. So you can load up a material like this if you want. And under the shading here, I'm going to show you how this is set up. So this is using Unreal Engine textures, but um, I invert the DirectX normal with the RGB curves. So it's change the green channel. Take these little this little line. It's usually this way. Just switch it. Just click and drag those little dots. Um, but screw all that up. There you go. Uh, but it's a packed um, metallic roughness normally. I don't know if I put all that in here. It's just roughness. Okay. So I'm not even using a metallic map on this. Normally it's an Unreal Engine setup. But anyways, uh, texture coordinate object into the mapping and do like so. All right, that'll work out. Now, sometimes you might actually want to scale these out a little bit. It just might be something you do. Uh, but if you do that, you'll see that the material goes along with it. So just keep in mind, if you, I'm going to do a cursor just selected real quick. If you create an empty plane axis, I'm not even going to do anything with it. I'm just going to leave it there. And I'm going to reference it real quick in here. See empty? You can name it if you want. Um, but when I move this object now, this doesn't move. The texture stays kind of where it's supposed to. And, but the only thing here is you have to change these to box and blend at point one. Okay, all of them. Okay. Well, they can be different values of blend, but basically it's a triplanar blending is what this is, more or less. Or world space mapping, whatever you want to call it. So you can do these kinds of setups like super fast. And these, as long as they're seamless, they should be seamless as long as you're on a grid line. Generally speaking, I'm not going to say it's always the case, but that's w about how it would work out. So if I want to add some metal to this, there we go. We got some metal here. So we, instead of doing it that way, where we arrange everything, we could just go to town and do it however we want. I like these ones personally, so I'm not going to touch them. But And then this floor down here as well. Um, you, know, you could do whatever you want here. Maybe this clay that's red or whatever, um, I could try to utilize it. I kind of like the patterns. Maybe I want like some textures going on like this and um, but I don't like the the color so this actually lets me tint it I don't know if I'll get the tint I want out of this but maybe I will yeah because the default color is red so it tints kind of weird uh, so I'm just going to detach all the color and then instead of using a multiply I'm just going to remove it. it gives us a base color I just want like a like a gray like that yeah Maybe I want it shinier, who knows? So I could take that roughness and unattach it as well. Of course, your roughness, you might want to do other things. Like maybe you want to add noise texture to it. You can do things like that. Uh, I don't even know if I can get to it through this list. Yeah. Yeah, actually. At the top, I don't know why Blender does this. This is weird. But it's been like this forever. And so, yeah, it's just like um, a noise texture. Here. That's going to be this number. So we can change like the roughness values, the scale. I like to bump it up pretty high. So it's gonna give me a little bit of something like that. This is a fun, quick way to kind of just um, work your... Otherwise, what would be a really simple texture, just to work it a little bit more. It just adds a little bit of noise to it, you know. Nothing real, real interesting, but... It happened that way, and so we can actually copy that setup there for the noise. I'm just going to copy it. I'm going to uh, paste it onto this one, and then I just do that for the roughness on all of these real quick. All right. So you can mix and mix and match things. Also, if you had like um, a roughness here, so I'm going to copy these two. I want to copy all of this actually, this whole line, all the way through here. And so for this one, maybe we don't use noise. Maybe we paste that whole setup in there. This is an Unreal Engine texture setup. So the green channel would be roughness, right? Metallic would be the blue channel. And so we could just change the main color, but it's using basically the same pieces of that, right? So maybe you want to do something like that. Maybe not. I don't know. I'll leave it like this. I think it's kind of interesting. Roughness. Not the metallic. 
Okay, so you can create all kinds of little interesting material textures that you can use to spice this stuff up is what I'm getting at. And, uh, but that quick, we have this setup uh, kind of done. So we can save this again. We can say trims or whatever, textures, floors. Uh, but we can select by the group. So Shift-G, select by collection. We can pull this out super fast if we wanted to in a position because it's on the grid, right? So that's what's fun about it. I'll put this one out real quick. This is trim. I'm just going to export it. It's going to take a second, but if we jump over to that folder, let it load it up. It should be exporting still. There you go. We'll see them pop into existence here as it does it, generally speaking. So we'll do that for that one. Um, we can actually move this back, give it a different name, call this floor tile A or something. I don't know, whatever. Grab this, just make sure you got it all selected, place it there. And now you can export. Um, Got to make sure you rename it, otherwise you replace your files, all right? And that's going to create floor tile. You can see it all just came in. Created all the floor tile ones, basically. And we don't really have to reset this up, reconfigure it, or nothing. And we, as long as we do it this way, there's a very little chance that we're actually going to mess up to the point where we can't. Uh, like if we replace the file by accident, we could just redo it again real quick. It's not a big deal. Uh, but now it's saved. It's good. We can go to another scene so we don't mess this one up. And um, we'll just set up the materials real quick. So we're going to create a plane. Uh, we could have just probably brought them in. To be honest, but uh, let's do new. These are trims. They're baked, so it's different. But let's do this. Okay, we got the two. We got the. We we'll probably want to name them trim or tile. Right, now you got that gun. There you go. Oh, it's the same. <laughs> I'm thinking it's object list. All right, so uh, let's go to shading. We're going to set one up. Uh, Node Wrangler add-on, enable it. So when you select the principal BSDF, you can hit Control-Shift-T. You can go to your folder, your textures, and you can see they're all here. Or tile A we're going to do first. So we're just going to... Um, Set it up. There you go. It's done. Or tile. Okay. All right. And so uh, we can just go and select the other texture. Material, I should say. Control Shift T. And this is going to be trim. All the way through. Boom. All right. So this is an easy way to get it done here in Blender. So if we look at it with the material preview. Okay. One out. See, we got both of these as being trims. I don't need that. I need a four tile. One trim here. Okay. So that's our setup right there. You see it happen. Now, uh, let's make them into walls and stuff. So I'm going to turn this plane upside down. Wrong way. Let's do it this way. Pull it on up. That origin point, I'm going to push down back into the bottom corner. So this is all of the, um, basically what we've been doing on the channel in the modular series, anyways, right? You can add some loop cuts. You can shift and skew this thing around as is like this. Now we don't necessarily have to do that. We can just use it for texturing purposes. But what I'm saying is that like you can just model whatever you want and then figure out how you're going to use this trim on it later on. Uh, that's doable. It's actually very fun. But you can model off of it too. So you can see certain actions will work. You don't have to always worry about having to re-unwrap something. Because if I do like um, a loop cut here, and I pull this out, you can see it does stretch it maybe, but if I bevel this now, we can get something like that going on as well. Right, pretty fun. And maybe right here, I bevel this. Uh, I'm going to inset, but I'm going to hit B so it doesn't create a little little hole in the corner here. I just want to create a little divot kind of thing going on, right? We can also shade auto smooth on this, believe it or not. You don't have to uh, necessarily make it super shaded perfect, but it's useful, but it's not necessary. Make some pretty janky shading on some pieces. You would probably never notice it in your favorite video game, but it exists everywhere. It's very common. 
Uh, what I want here is select. There you go. Doing selection less, but you could stretch things like this out. Uh, if you have to, you have to, right? There's no way around it. But like, let's say this is all stretched now. We got to re-unwrap it. UV toolkit uh, is what I personally use, but you can't really buy it no more. Uh, I still like it the most, but there's one called text tools. It's an add-on that's free. It has UV layout tools here. Um, so a lot of times when you unwrap these things, it might come in like too small or something like that. But you can literally just click crop now and boom, you get that, right? And uh, so now you can just kind of like relay it out real quick. Not even think about it for the most part. All right. And, um, I want to do additional adjustments in areas like this as well. Like right here. So you might start detailing this. Now, if you're going to plan on bending this wall, which you probably are, try to work in quads. Um, for like the unoptimal version of it. You can do quads all over the place. It's fine. When you do a bevel like this, just make sure you're doing um, probably even numbers here, like 0.5 or something. So that should be on the grid still. Basically, that's what I'm getting at. So you can't actually bend this potentially, right? If you have enough geometry working in the right directions, what eventually will happen, at least, is that Sometimes you gotta line things up manually. What what eventually will happen is that you'll actually be able to go through these areas and just make little fine adjustments later on. So you're almost remodeling these things more purposeful at this point. But be very particular about it. That's what I'm trying to get at. Optimize them at the very last moment, but you can see how we can almost pull that out like that now. So we'll do that to this one right here. Oh, I didn't add a cut there. Okay, yeah. So this can quickly become out of control as well. <laughs> like you can actually have issues with this quite a bit. It's not necessarily the easiest thing. Like I missed a loop cut right there. You probably want that loop cut. Dead honest. So now I can pull those all out together. And done like that. Okay. Section here, maybe I want to bevel. So I can do another inset in this area from here to here. I can literally just push it back. Um, I wouldn't personally unwrap that again, but you could, actually. I think that'll work out fine there. As you can see now, this is going to start laying out something like that. So it's more or less kind of like, yeah, we're making a wall unit, okay? But this is also kind of how you would make like a subway train or um, whatever, right? There's all kinds of different things you can make, but like if you wanted to make a, uh, a bending corner unit, that real quick so you can do corners like this by the way it's not necessarily a bad thing I think fallout did this um, quite a bit so but let's see I'm gonna have it yeah go I don't know where I want the unit to go yet where I'm gonna place it I might stop it short I might stop it long I don't know anyway so here's the deal Put the origin point down here. Make sure you apply your rotations and scales. There we go. And um, we're going to use the modifier list add-on for this, but we're going to apply a simple deform. I already did a video on this, so I'm going to go through it kind of fast. But uh, Z, we're doing a bend. In this case, we're going to be doing a negative 45. Oh, negative 90, sorry. Negative 45. We can do that number like that. We need an empty. So if we press uh, Shift S cursor to select it, we can place that there. We can create an empty plane axis, right? And then you reference it right here, basically. Or if you have this add on, you just click here. 
and it creates the empty for you. It's back there. Okay. And um, we're going to need that because we want this to meet up with each other. Uh, I'm guessing we're going to go short with it. But we take this empty, press G, Y, hold control, and we can snap uh, control and shift. We can snap like so. We're just trying to get these close. They're never going to be quite perfect. And you actually have to manually adjust this to um, make them perfect. But I get them as close as I can because I know for a fact that if I, if I do that, and I take this whole edge here, we're going to apply the, uh, the simple deform first, okay? We're going to apply that. And if I take this edge here, just back it up a little bit. This, as long as you're not using correct face attributes, this will skew the texture, right? But it's going to repair itself once we snap to the vertices of the other mesh. So these vertices have to actually line up as well. This is where it helps to have wireframe. So if you need wireframe, just go up here and uh, this box, right click it, add it to a shortcut so you can always get to it if you need to. But we can go around and we start, um, we'll just turn on snapping. And we'll just start snapping these vertices one at a time. And as we do this, you'll notice that that texture doesn't actually get messed up, which is nice. Okay. Could potentially try to do groups. I, I wouldn't rush it though. I'd just be, I take my time doing this. This is fun. Pushing and pulling polygons like this, right? So now, like if we did a group, see, like it's, it's probably going to work to be honest. It's, it's just that I don't know if I trust it fully. I have trust issues with uh, 3D software. So it's okay, but middle click, you can zoom in on a certain location. So, oh wait, excuse me, not middle click, alt middle click. Now we can go through and get this going. Notice this wall is not solid. Um, there's nothing to stop you from working with solid units, solid wall setups. Like I use non-manifold mesh, generally speaking, because at some point I'm probably going to cull things out anyways, but I don't mind calling them earlier as opposed to later. Oh, what's going on here? What's that? See that? Um, yeah, there's uh, two vertices. That's a really tight area. See, that? that's one of the reasons you might want to do something like that, right? So, this is the way it goes. Until you're zooming heavily in on objects, you're probably not making them right. I'm just going to tell you that right now. I'm not saying you're making them entirely wrong. You're probably, you might be making them right, but this is this is a thing for sure. There's two verts down here. This is how I got into all this, basically. You can see perfect alignment now. Might be a little bit off in these areas, but it doesn't really matter if it is, because the odds of us having to meet up with it are pretty slim. Uh, the biggest issue we actually have created is that this is a single unit. We really needed it to be all the way out to here. So we would have had to double up the, uh, the wall and pull it out like that. But um, that's okay, because we can always do other little kind of interesting things, like say, uh, let's snap this back to the grid. It's a problem right now. We're going to snap off. And uh, you can see things like this. Like sometimes you got to skew. From one section to another section, uh, something like that, All right? And you'll see the number here is a negative one. So this could be another unit as well, and this is like a corrective unit potentially. Like you see, we jump back two spaces. Um, skewing, by the way, is Control Alt Shift S, and then you might have to define an axis, so like Y or X or whatever. Um, but you may also want to just go somewhere in between that. Maybe like a negative 0.5. Right. That'll give you that little one meter section as well. So that can be quite useful. Um, generally speaking, it's a good idea if you're going to do that. You combine these together and kind of create your own little bevel here, basically, right? Uh, it's a little challenging on a kit because you can't just bevel this corner. Like, you really can't. Um, so there's different ways you can go about approaching this. 
if you join these, let's do it. Let's try it real quick. Merge it all by distance. See here, like you can't really. <laughs> There's too much stuff going on. It's going to be hard, right? So you might have to dissolve things, which might mess up some of your details if you're not careful. And all that other fun stuff. Uh, personally, what I would do, I would start with a base unit again. I think. Um, something like this, perhaps. And maybe just grab it. In this situation, anyways, we'll just grab it and a proportional edit it. Maybe we'll just move it like that. It's going to give you a little bit of a soft look, though, right? That's kind of fun, but maybe that's not something you want. Maybe you want to do linear instead of smooth. Right. You'll see that gives you a more skewed effect. But it's kind of screwing up my side over here too. I don't know why it's doing that. I didn't grab it all, I guess. Yeah, that could be a problem. So let's try that G, X, and then back. Okay, that's a lot more predictable now. I like that. So it's going to start to create that effect of being around here. It's very linear though, so it flattens it out. Uh, set flow add-on, lifesaver. It will skew your UVs, though. See? So, you got to be careful with that one on these. Might have to re-unwrap it because of that. Re-unwrapping is a pain. This is why I try to say, like, don't do it if you don't have to. Uh, because trying to line a unit up with another unit you're pretty much working with them at the same time at that point, but you're going to be doing one maybe over here and then just making sure it all works or maybe little sections. You can work in little sections. So like you might do like this loop here and this loop here, and then uh, you'll have your UVs all blown out and separated and stuff. Uh, in this case, they don't separate, but all right, fine. And so... You'll have to just go in and just start doing like little minor adjustments, basically. Just little little things like this might be unaligned with another edge. That's this face and this face. We'll use these ones as examples, but like say this edge was just slightly off, right? Eh, it's not even going to let me what's going on. What is it selecting? The whole face? Yeah, no. Oh, we got proportional edit on over here, too, apparently. <laughs> That's what happened. Okay, so a lot of times they become misaligned like this. This add-on is a lifesaver. Machine tools is better, though, um, because you can grab these with machine tools and just align them, like, super fast. For whatever reason, I think it's this add-on that breaks it, but um, you have to use the add-on once you use these, um, I believe. So... They, they conflict. It's weird. Anyway, so what happens here in the middle isn't as important as what happens like right here on these sides, right? Like this and this and this and this will have to meet. You will have to have the same vertices. If you have a free flow, like say you had two different kit pieces, one has a vertex here in the middle, right? So we subdivide that one edge. Like that's doable, but then you have one like this, but it needs to have a seamless texture all the way across. Uh, that means you're going to have to control that single point in free space on this edge. So you'll never necessarily get them to line up perfectly. So you really need to match the uh, the geometry with each other in, when you're trying to match textures as well. Um, if it's different textures, it doesn't really matter. Like if it's if you got like a like a, a pillar here, for example, or something. Let's make a quick like idea of a pillar. You know, this, this won't really matter at the end of the day because it's just super fast. And we'll just chamfer all the edges here. Do a U unwrap. Oh, let's take these away real quick. Let's split it, I think, right there on the side. Let's select that edge. <laughs> Forward slash. I don't have an edge. All right, so we can control E, bridge edge loop, or excuse me. We'll just control E, mark seams, and then uh, we can unwrap. Boom. Done. All right, there we go. Let's 
way over there for some reason. All right. This needs some materials, so we'll use the... Um, I was wondering what the floor would look like, but... Uh, yeah, let's try the floor, I guess. We'll see what happens. That's a seamless texture, right? It's not a trim, but... You can do things like this. I mean, it's not says you can't. Might have to apply a scale here to get it to unwrap more correctly. There you go. You can rotate these while holding control. You can snap them. Absolute grid snap. You see how they didn't line up with each other? When you grid snap, it'll snap center. It'll snap center. That's good. You can also hold control and scale and snap. Uh, but it doesn't always go out to the boundary. Sometimes it gets close, though. It's pretty nice, but that's where this um, little crop feature comes in here. You can start to line things up like that. We can scale this up by two times. Do things like that. So you can see we got this more interesting kind of a unit setup thing. I'm going to re-bevel these, not the uh, seams though. Shade it auto smooth, weight the normal. There we go. Okay, so yeah, maybe that's cool. Maybe it's not. Let's change it to the trim. See, we could do something like that. Maybe scale it back down like 0.5. And we can kind of continue the wall pattern a little bit. Um, and you can see here just being able to line straight up, top and down. Uh, because we basically started with that plane. They're more or less close to to lined up perfectly. Close. They're not quite. But uh, that's you can see none of these vertices line up with each other. So <laughs> they don't have vertices. This one doesn't have vertices. But now we have to be extremely careful with how we do this. And this can be really tedious trying to line these things up. I don't recommend doing that. So there's all kinds of little things you can do, but just because you can doesn't mean you probably should. Sometimes you have to, though. So I probably would give up on the idea of like lining these up perfectly. I'd find a way to cover these little areas, perhaps, that maybe where they miss the line or whatever. But this looks nice, too. It doesn't look that bad. And um, it's something you could run with if you wanted. It's all, it's all up to you. I'd personally probably rotate this thing. 90 degrees. Some textures you can get away with this, some you can't. If you have textures that have like drips going down in a certain direction or whatever, right? It, it's meant to be used up and down, basically. Then uh, you can't always get away with rotating things like this. So. Let's see. Oh, yeah, we could do do some things here do that one might be something we want yeah I don't mind that one that one looks all right not too bad a little a little harsh down here but it's okay this one I'm just gonna extrude it up and a lot of times I'll just um, unwrap things like this I'll smart project them or whatever if I know it's not likely to be seen, I just want to add some kind of material there so that it's, well, it's there. Um, how other guys do it, completely up to them, I guess, but I think that works out fine, personally. So that's all I'm going to do. Not worry about it. And but I can lay this out now. If I hit uh, Shift-D, it duplicates. Alt-D creates a linked copy or an instance, basically. So Alt-D, hold Control, and then Shift-R, you can repeat. You can quickly lay sections out like this. Alt D, Alt Control. Now uh, Shift R if needed. Right. Same for the walls. It can be quite useful. And for this particular one, I think. Keep the flat one there. Okay. So this would be its own piece. This would be its own piece. Obviously, we're going to keep going around with, with that kind of setup. And so. You'd want to create like roof tiles and all kinds of other fun stuff as well. And uh, But when all is said and done, start to get the idea here that we've probably made these too small. Uh, whoops. Not a big deal. You can see the size of a character, like a drop-in character, can be quite useful. Um, it's only a two meter tall section, right? Um, when you have these lined up um, on the grid, right? 
and you scale these up. So if I make these four meters now, okay, you can also do it by active element, which is nice. So like if we scale from here, we can do that. That's a uh, 1.5 increase. Scale that up by 1.5, right? Um, the floor tiles, I don't think I'm going to change. I create, keep creating instances though, so I don't have to worry about these later on. You can make bigger sections as well. Uh, but basically, got a pillar. You can just sink that into the wall. Why not? Instance it out as well. Put one over here. Why not? Okay. Now, let's go ahead and um, just do a little bit more here. I don't want to get too crazy with this one. Uh, but basically, I'm going to kind of eyeball this, I think. I'm going to duplicate this. Not, not create an instance. And it should not be a duplicate of an instance. So, yeah, shouldn't mess anything else up. I just want to check. All right. Um, we're going to do the simple deform. So we're going to do the simple deform, change it to bin. We're going to do a 90, negative 90. On Z. That's not what I want. Apply rotation to scale. Okay, so a regular 90, not a negative 90. There. Okay, we do need that empty real quick. And now I'm going to push it out like this for the most part. It's slightly misaligned. So I'm just going to press G and Y. And I'm going to bring it back to about here. And that's it. I'm not doing anything else other than that. That's all I want. So you can see here, it starts just slightly over that, and it ends slightly over that. And you'll see over here, it starts slightly over it, and it ends slightly over it. That's all we need. We can apply this. We can uh, get rid of that empty. We want to just control period, move this origin point right here. Control period, turn it off. Do that in the top view, it's easier. So now we can actually, um, well, we could try to spin this out. But we know it's not aligned perfectly. Okay. So instead, using Mesh Machine in edit mode, you could do this in object mode with a mirror modifier, but just Alt X or whatever the shortcut is. And then just mirror it. Boom. Created this like big pillar section now. Super fast. It's pretty efficient. So uh, it's using basically the same um, wall section, right? Uh, that's why dicing it up like that can be kind of important because it need the rotation ability, right? So this is now a pretty tight mesh. It's not really shaded all that bad either, but we didn't have to actually go around and uh, UV map this thing again, which would have been a nightmare. Uh, these little things like this can be even worse to do. So if you don't make your mesh, you know, well made to the point where it can deform uh, like your wall meshes, uh, it might be a little bit of a problem. What eventually you'll do is you might go back over this and say like, well, this wall isn't going to bend here. I don't know why I would need any of these units. Uh, this one maybe we'll need because you, you see, like, well, maybe we need some of these up here to hold this in place, right? So you can dissolve except for those those elements. It might triangulate kind of bad. It just depends. It's, you're going to have to play around with it. But you can do all kinds of fun stuff when it comes to like sliding. You can use correct face attributes like 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 that, right? Uh, but it gets even better if you turn on with Mesh Machine the surface slide feature. Okay, so now that's basically out of like a weird temporary shrink wrap thing. But basically your face constraint like max. Um, and you turn on correct face attributes. You might want to keep connected as well. It's optional, but... Um, you can kind of slide mesh around still, not not really worry about it a whole lot. It's kind of interesting, right? So UV mapping 
there's a lot that can go into it but it's really quite simple once you know some of these little tricks it it can take a little while to find videos about this kind of stuff though so that's why i made this one and it's really just something you got to get used to working with i mean there's other ways of working too like this is just one kind of this is like an older technique almost uh, but you know there's like working with um, skins now and just doing a bunch of really dirty triangulation stuff it, that works out quite well and data transfers for uh, different pieces so really cool stuff out there when it comes to all this but um which one is it this one okay so i want to make sure i turn off that surface slide real quick oh no bug. not good okay so we're going to save this into models folder We'll say uh, get pieces underscore oh one. I just want to mention something about this. Usually, when you get a bug, sometimes it means Blender's about to crash. Not always, but a lot of times it can. Because uh, I need to turn, um, need to turn that feature off in it. <laughs> now it won't turn off. It's incredible. Uh, okay, I guess I can just get rid of it and it get, and then it works. Let's see if I can turn it back on. Turn it back off. I can't. Oh, that's interesting. I have never seen that one before, so that's kind of cool. I geeked it up somehow. So do save a lot if you can. Uh, kit pieces 01 is what I named this one. You can name it whatever you want, but put underscore 01 to get started. Uh, when you're using machine tools, incremental save. All right. Every time you hit that, it's going to create another save file. So it'll become 02. 03, 04, 05. So you kind of keep a, um, a repository of things because you might at some point be like, I really liked what I did way back there and I, or I need that shape again and I maybe lost it or something. You can always go get it. Um, recovery also works. I've never had it really fail me a whole lot, um, but it doesn't recursively save file. Like it doesn't save, like it replaces the recovery file sometimes, which is annoying. Um, so there's supposedly add-ons for this kind of stuff that help out, but generally I'm, I'd much rather just be a little bit more careful and not worry about losing files and stuff. And uh, So last thing here I'm going to show you for this one before we call it quits. Um, your render, uh, like you could do a render setup, I mean, if you wanted, but I like to do these little preview renders where uh, I'll use scene lights in the HDRI file. I'm just going to drop the strength, right? I'm just going to drop it down. And we're going to change the lighting setup here to, so you can load up your own custom HDRIs. There's an add-on uh, that lets you spin lights like this. You can add a light, spotlight. You just crank it up, maybe make the uh, size a little bit bigger, blend it more, change the color around. That's too yellow. Let's do like off yellow. There you go. And um, this world opacity, I'm going to crank it on a little bit. A little bit blurry, but um, the strength here, you can just kind of crank down pretty heavily. So that's going to kill off most of the lighting, which is usually what I do for like my little sci-fi looking stuff, right? And uh, tweak the color of the light. There's very subtle differences here for the lights. Uh, Just gonna place one out here as well. I do one on the middle of the wall. I think that size is a little off. It's a little too much. I crank that power up too. That's probably too much as well. You'll tell if it's too much power if you go into uh, cycles. <laughs> Everything will be like super bright. Okay. So we can get away with some stuff like this, right? I told you we were going to create something like that little intro there. Might want to change some of these colors every now and then. Maybe like over here. This is kind of like a temporary light setup. This isn't necessarily like the best light setup ever, right? Something like that one there. Yeah, of course, you would want to create your props and everything else. I'm going to turn off um, extras that gets rid of the lights now. And I think it's still a little too bright. Let's try some different light setups here. Let's 
it's real dark HDRI. The studio lighting from Substance, I think. It's pretty impressive. But... Let's do this Force one. Yeah, this Force one's pretty cool. It's like blurred out like this and darkened. Turn that strength down. And otherwise, that green drives me nuts. Like some of these Force ones, the green's too bright. I'm not a big fan of that, but. Let's turn the extras back on for a second. I want to pull these ones up a little bit. It's also IES profiles for cycles that work out pretty well. Pixar has some free ones available for download if you want to check them out in the resources section, which is cool. Um, but other than that, I had a whole lot of time to... I haven't taken the time really to create a real proper environment, but... I really need to because it's a lot of fun. And once these things go together, like it's it's insane, right? And so just keep in mind, I guess we'll do one more little thing. When you're creating modular pieces, you're snapping them to the grid or whatever. Origin points matter. But a lot of times wall units, if I bevel a single vertex here, they're not much more than this, right? So think about all the things you can design and create with this. And your units themselves, they, normally they're going to be only modular in one direction, but the only thing that really matters is the edges, where they meet each other, the vertices where they meet, okay? And um, where their origin point is located is, is mostly important. Because these should all, you know, kind of have a flow to them, where they run back into themselves at some point, and they line back up. All right. If they don't line back up, you start to have to create like little transition pieces, like kind of maybe that little skewing piece, right? And so then you'll run into little issues like that. But they should almost always come back to the grid. Now, uh, just one thing I want to kind of re-mention here is that the grid itself uh, changes size as well. So you, a lot of guys are going to end up working at like one meter grids. But in reality, you're working down to the 10 centimeter grid. Anything below that can become a little bit hard to use. Um, but certain objects, when you're modeling them at least, might be using like one centimeter grid, right? Trying to keep everything lined up on a grid point at some, some place makes everything a lot easier to manage when modeling. That's really what it's about. It's not so much like, it, like you're able to just lay things out in particular areas super fast and know how they're going to function and work with each other. Um, the system is yours at the end of the day, like the kind of unit setups you use. Um, but there are some like limitations to it, right? Like you're you're going to find times that like um, if you were to take a, for example, like a three meter or a six meter wall and you had the pivot point at the towards the base there, if that plane that you're creating for the wall is um, is vertically uh, on a plane, right? Like it's straight up and down. Those two vertices, when you rotate that whole unit over at 30 degrees or 60 degrees, uh, what happens is it'll snap back to the grid at the 10 centimeter grid, but not the meter grid. It'll get back to the meter grid at um, 30 meters, which is you know something you could potentially do, especially on bigger, larger structures, but maybe it's not something you want to do. Um, and then if you create transition pieces for it, so maybe you take it from the 10 centimeter grid back off of it at some point as well. Um, things like that. Also, cylinders, you got to remember um, these little cylinder pieces like this. This was a 32-sided one. So um, I believe these are, I'm not sure, they should be a, um, a 11, maybe the 11.25 or 22.5, I don't remember. 32 is, I'm not sure. Let's see. We're going to check the uh, angles here. I don't know if it'll pop up right away, but we got to turn extras back on too. Might have to extrude as well, which is going to be weird. Sometimes it does this weird stuff where you can't see it, but. Is it only a solid view? Where is it? Where did it go? All right, I'm a little confused now. It should be popping up right now, but basically, um,
it's not. I might have turned off an option for it. Oh, text info. There you go. That's what we're looking for. It can be hard to see, but uh, let's take a look at edges. Does it shut? No, it doesn't. It should shut right here then. Seven. Uh, these are seven dot fives. My bad. Okay. Seven dot five degrees for this bin here. All right. So the way this works, and as the reason I'm pointing this out is because the way this works is, um, I should make another video all about this kind of stuff, right? But uh, just create a cylinder. How about that? Create an eight-sided one. I don't know where it is. It's somewhere up there. Okay. We look at the sides here. These are. Um, I can get to see it. Jeez, it's 45 degrees, right? So eight-sided cylinders are 45 degrees. Um, when you go up in numbers or down in numbers, like think of it like this: uh, you got a 90-degree angle, right? Like here's a 90, and um, so that's your 90. But what's half of that? It's 45. Then what's half of that, right? And you got 22.5. Then you got you see what's working out there. So those are like. Uh, I don't know what you would call them, arcs, minutes of angles, degrees, whatever. But the, the idea here is that um, you can go down further and further in halves and get more and more. So like a 64 segment cylinder ends up being a 5.252 or something like that um, when it comes to the angle there. So you can make modular pieces that actually pre-bend at these ratios in order to create big cylinders and stuff. Um, and you can snap units to units with vertex snapping. You don't always have to work on a grid. It just gets a little bit more complicated. But uh, anyway, so the whole idea, anyways, we're getting a little off topic here, right? So the whole idea was just to kind of get you guys started with this idea and um, just making some cool looking stuff rather quickly, not thinking about it too much. And just keep in mind that these modular units, it's almost like doing 2D graphics. You know, it's not, it's just three dimensional version of it. That's all it comes down to. Like you can rotate things, you can make them loop back on themselves. You can make little transition pieces that, um, you know, just have a little bit of a different effect to them. You w you may have to go and spend some time uh, re UV mapping them. Perhaps I know it's not like the best answer there. It's not the most fun, but um, occasionally it happens, right? Where you'll you'll find yourself in those predicaments. So I have to join something together, merge it, separate it, pull it apart. Go back and forth, round and round and round you go. And then uh, eventually you'll get these little granular pieces uh, where you could use them to create whatever it is you want to create. So check this out, right? Uh, this is just a cube. It looked like a graphic design. That's what the idea was. Uh, but if I alt in and I recalculate everything on the inside, let's go to solid view for a second. Uh, let's knock out some of these planes, basically. See what's going on? You think of modular kits in this manner, but you have to add depth to the walls. That's it. That's pretty much it. If you want to have a, like a really robust system, anyways. If you just have an only indoor environment, you know, maybe you could get away with something like this. It probably wouldn't hurt. You can use it like a pipe dream. Think um, think some of those little uh, water flowing through the pipes games, right? These are too big for that, but if we made them flow in one direction, so we could say like this one's a little thinner, this one would have to be thinner for it, and then but this one would be thinner too. So we could do, but they have to go to the extents, right? So they would all be like this, and this one I don't know how to fix it, but whatever. It'd be somewhere in the middle like that. This whole segment would come down, potentially anyways. And so you get the idea that would be the elbow, generally speaking, it's supposed to be somewhere. All messed up now though. Bad example, but you get the idea. Um, same with like uh, cylindrical pipes, right? Just do one of those real quick. If you had a pipe like this, you might want, you know, like an elbow, right? 
elbow pipe or whatever. So we join these two. We can take these two faces, bridge edge loops. Let's try again, make it prettier. We'll do a number of cuts here. Okay. You can also adjust the uh, smoothness factor, which is nice. So there we go. We got an elbow. We got a pipe run, maybe. Something like that. See? And then we can create other shapes as well. So that's when you start creating like your little um, T joints or whatever. So you can take like two of them. It's going to be a good chance I need this centered. So I have to make sure the uh, pieces on the outside here are also allowing that to occur. That maybe. Okay. I'm going to cut this one. Right here. I'm just going to um, refill it real quick on the back side. So I'm going to press A, F. It fills in that face. That way I can just union these real quick. The uh, bull tools is just a destructive union. So Control Shift B, Auto Boolean. Okay. Uh, shade Auto Smooth. Bump up the amount if you need to. Right. Weight the normals, sharpen, whatever. Um, I probably have to clean this one up a little bit, but you get the idea. But think about it. This is like one of your more universal systems because now this not only works here, but it could potentially, if you had the origin points placed like right here, right? You could potentially just rotate these too, right? Like you could do all kinds of nonsense now, right? And do that number. And if you're snapping them to one one another, it could potentially just do all kinds of nonsense. Maybe you want something like that or like that. Like this little fat piece there, you know, that's cool. Whatever, so you can make a, your you can go to town on this however you see fit. That's kind of why I did that little kid op space station video. Just so you get the idea of how fast that goes uh, but it gets even better this is just one example uh, the same way we did with the cube over there if you flip all these back around merge them first and then we'll calculate them inside bam you think of these as tunnels as well right so maybe there's like a little play area you go into and then you jump down and there's got to climb a ladder up see what i'm saying this could be like large sections of levels, not necessarily just uh, little pipes. And so that's why when you're looking at this stuff, you need to think very two, 2D almost. Um, and then you'll figure out that footprint. Bounding box is the footprint of the object, basically. Whatever space it occupies after block out, um, its footprint, generally speaking, this is for larger kind of teams or big projects. But uh, like a level designer, he's going to go to town just laying out basic modular components, and it's going to be up to the artist to go back through and polish all these back up at some point, right? Um, so you'll have to respect those boundary points at some point. But um, generally speaking, not not really such a big deal. I think you guys um, probably getting the hang of this by now throughout this uh, series. It's just you want to spend some time on it. I'm just trying to make these as fast as possible, these tutorials, uh, to try to just help you out along the way. And that's really what they're about. So when it comes to uh, this stuff, though, it's just some basic fundamentals of 3D modeling. You want to do the least amount possible um, in order to achieve the results you want. So you, you kind of want to be cheap in a way, but you don't want to be cheap on the art side of things. You just want to be cheap on, you know, reutilizing parts and, and trying to spice them up as easily as possible so um but yeah it's it's really not that bad right so anyways i think for the modular series here i might do some more practical examples like this in the future i don't know yet um, which ones i might be doing i might be going into unreal engine or maybe even unity i don't know yet um, but for now i hope this one helps you out a lot more and get a good idea of like how you can start working with these things and just one final note. Uh, sometimes you can see I call right the back faces here. You don't have to. And a matter of fact, it's sometimes better not to when you're blocking things out and you're trying to figure out what what pieces you're going to need and and whatnot. 
So just keep that in mind. Sometimes it's not better to call them out right away. Um, only really when it comes down to, uh, I think when you're doing some texturing and stuff, it, it's easier to call it out and then add it back perhaps. Um, but I don't know. It just depends. Everybody has their own methods and ways of working. So um, anyways, that's it for this video, guys. I really hope you enjoyed this one. Spent some time kind of prepping for this so you guys get a good idea of what's going on, what's going on here without hanging up too much anyway. So if you enjoyed the video, give it a like, subscribe to the channel. Um, I'll check you guys out next time. All right. Take care.